Greetings, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here and to help kick off Climate Forward 2021. I want to start by speaking directly from my heart. I'm an environmental scientist who has worked on issues related to the sustainability and quality of aquatic environments, lakes, streams, and oceans, and the organisms, bacteria, plankton, and fish who live in them for more than four decades. Studying them and teaching about them has been and is my passion, and it has been that for most of my life. But our world is at a crossroads, and the point of no return for some species and places, some may say. And that is not only for aquatic environments, but for ecosystems, biodiversity, and humanity's use of them. If we're to really make a change, to really listen to the voices of our youth, to work toward a sustainable planet, the time is now. The late Dana Meadows, who wrote Limits to Growth and was one of the first well-established systems ecologists, Dana once said, if we believe that it's effectively over, that we are fatally flawed, that each of us is too small and helpless to do anything, then we should just give up. Then yes, it's over. But I don't believe that stuff at all, she said. I don't see myself or the people around me as fatally flawed. We are not helpless and there is nothing wrong with us except for the strange belief that we are helpless and that there is something wrong with us. All we need to do is to stop letting that belief paralyze our minds, our hearts, and our souls. Today's conference is all about taking that step, about opening our minds to solutions and believing in ourselves. And I want to start with a big thank you to our hosts, the USC Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies, the USC Dornsife Center for the Political Future, and GROW at Annenberg. They've done a terrific job bringing together thoughtful, creative leaders to look at climate change issues. And I want to acknowledge their partners as well. The USC Staff Assembly Environment and Safety Committee, the Office of Sustainability, the USC Dornsife Environmental Studies Program, and the Unruh Associates. We all know that a conference like this does not just come together overnight. It takes dedication and passion of many people in many places, and their excellent work is a gift to us. This four-day conference will cover four different policy areas, with each day taking a new focus. These areas range from social justice to business and from communication to politics. We're going to tackle complex thought-provoking questions like, is access to clean air and water a human rights issue? What is the role of business in contributing to climate change and in mitigating it? Why are red and blue states seeing climate change differently? And how should Southern California move forward on climate change issues? Our panelists will share exciting new ideas and help us see these questions in a fresh, and nuanced light. I know we are all looking forward to the insights that will come from these four days together and continuing these conversations well after this time in our own communities. As president of USC, I often talk about sustainability and climate change issues and how the USC community is embracing the importance of working towards solutions. And I know and we know that it's going to take everyone working together to find these grand challenge solutions and to chart a more sustainable, equitable, strategic path forward. But we all need hope. And for me, that hope comes from the commitment and the drive that I see every single day at USC. I see it strongly and passionately among our students, our staff, our faculty, and our neighbors. And I see it in the meaningful conferences like the one we're gathering for this week. These discussions are really important and they keep us engaged and informed and they keep climate change front and center in our conversations. I wanna thank you all for being here and being part of that solution. 
I hope you all enjoy and are stimulated by this conference, and I know that we will continue to fight on together. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Happy Earth Week, and welcome to today's, clim uh, today's Climate Forward Business Roundtable. I'm Joe Arvai, uh, and I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies here at the University of Southern California. Um, before we begin, it's really crucial that I let you know that we're bringing you today's roundtable from USC, which resides on the sacred and traditional lands of this region's First Peoples. They are the Tongva Gabrielino. Uh, we recognize the Tongva and the broader community of First Peoples as the original stewards of this continent, and they continue as the traditional caretakers of our land uh, today, and for that we remain incredibly grateful. All of us involved in Climate Forward pay our respect to their elders uh, and people past uh, and present. Uh, at Wrigley, we're also grateful uh, for our partnership in hosting this Climate Forward Week of events with the USC Dorn's Life Center for the Political Future and also our partners at Grow at Annenberg. Um, and then without further ado, let's jump into the topic of today's roundtable. Um, for those of you who know me and even for those of you who don't, I'll let you know that I've worked for about a decade as a business school professor um, and an, as an advisor to companies big and small before I joined uh, the University of Southern California. And it's not hyperbole when I tell you that barely a day went by where in my business school roles, we didn't talk about the role that business plays in creating, but also in addressing uh, climate change risks and broadly about the role of business schools in helping to train the next generation of sustainability-minded business leaders. So it'll come as no surprise to, to you that we'll be having a conversation today about these topics as well as other topics that are brought up uh, as we go. I'm incredibly lucky to be joined by a very distinguished group of leaders working at the intersection of business and sustainability. They are Alyssa Foster, the Senior Manager of Product Responsibility at Patagonia, Amy Lures, the Global Lead for Sustainability Science at Microsoft, Elizabeth Sturkin, the Managing Director for EDF Plus Business at the Environmental Defense Fund, and John Vieira, the former Global Director of Sustainability and Vehicle Environmental Matters at the Ford Motor Company. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us um, today. Let's jump um, right in, if you don't mind. I think people are keen to see what you have to say. Maybe Elizabeth, starting with you, I'll, I'll give you a really easy question. Um, are the world's largest and most recognizable companies to blame for the risks we currently face, face globally um, from climate change? Yeah, thanks for, for the nice introduction, Joe. I'm really excited. Um, and yes, the answer is that business bears a huge responsibility for the climate crisis that we're in. And I, I think we're also seeing companies in the lead on addressing the climate problem. Uh, when I saw the red alert from the UN about a month ago, um, reporting out on what the countries had committed to, it's very clear that it is not enough. And the countries alone can't get there. We need business to lead also. And we're seeing a record number of companies set net zero goals, which is hugely ambitious. Um, what else needs to happen is that those net zero goals need to be followed by detailed net zero transition plans. And very critically to not confound what net zero for the planet means uh, versus what net zero for a company means. So um, I, I think, yeah, we, we all bear responsibility and, and companies really do too. And I think the leading ones are really recognizing that and stepping up in a way that um, is really unprecedented as I've seen over, over my career. Other panelists, your thoughts on this and, and maybe even to the question of how did we get here? I mean, it's pretty serious, the crisis we're dealing with. I'll, I'll jump in, jump in. You know, I, I think it's it's hard to separate out the roles of the public and private sector in, in how we got here. You know, it's, you know, separating it out, gov governments, business, culture, our lifestyles. It, we got across, we got to make changes across all of those. And um, uh, certainly business, big corporations have a big 
uh, a big role to play in both getting us out of the mess we're in and having gotten us into the mess we're in. But I don't think you can, you can actually isolate that from the lifestyle choices that we're making and the governance choices that we're making. So I'm always careful about you know looking for those systems changes and um, and not not honing in on one piece of the challenge. Other thoughts on this one? Well, John, I mean, talking about the kind of changes that we're going to need, you worked at the Ford Motor Company for quite some time. You were instrumental in pushing that company forward. Maybe starting with you, what needs to change within corporate America in order for it to play a more meaningful role in cutting carbon emissions? And maybe even beyond that, lowering the risks we face from climate change today. And I sort of add this last part because even if we could dial back carbon emissions to zero, like flicking a switch today, there's an awful lot of inertia in the climate system. So there's sort of this long-term picture, but also this very short-term picture. What are you thinking about when you think about the kinds of things companies ought to be doing to you know, move us forward on the climate um, file? Yeah, it's a, so it's a rich, a rich question. And, and Elizabeth and I did not talk before this panel. Um, so we, I'm not going to uh, say that the, the, the recommendations I made were because I talked to Elizabeth, but I would like to give Joe and everybody on the, uh, the, the webinar here, um, I'm gonna give five areas because I don't think it's just one, um, five areas that I think corporate America can act on. And the first one I was gonna start with is what Elizabeth brought up. And that's setting carbon reduction goals. And it sounds, okay, that's pretty fundamental, right? I mean, everybody should be doing that. Well, number one, everybody's not doing that. Secondly, those goals need to be tied to something like the Paris Accord reduction. So too many companies, you know, several years ago and even now, they just talked about that. Well, yeah, we're going to reduce our emissions by 50% in 10 years. Well, okay, I don't know if that's good or that's bad, but, you know, let's tie it to something that's recognizable. I think the Paris Accord reduction levels are the right way to go kind of at a minimum. And I also like, like what Elizabeth said was, you need to set aspirational goals, you know, getting to that net zero, which you have to do now. And now don't just set those without any roadmap. You have to have a roadmap and start doing something now. Now, you know, in talking to my colleagues that were at EDF and some of the other NGOs, you might not have a roadmap tomorrow on how to get there, but set that aspirational goal and give some timing when you'll have that roadmap. So I think that's really key for companies to really think about those goals and the right type of goals. I think secondly, when we talk about big businesses, you know, you, you are a role model, big businesses are a role model for smaller businesses. So when we talk about setting reduction goals, the supply base is watching, the supply base is following, the acceleration impact of large corporate America that it has on smaller businesses can be profound because they're going to follow you and, you know, take it a step further, require them to follow you, right? You could really accelerate, you know, the efforts of others. Next, from a policy standpoint, I know, Joe, we're probably going to touch on this later on during the discussion, but be advocates for good policy and do that collectively. Join with other companies. And oh, by the way, you don't have to join with other companies in your industry. Think about Good, for instance, the, the latest infrastructure plan, great policy, right? We need to promote more electric vehicles. The infrastructure plan has $180 billion for electric charging stations, right? Get behind good policies that also promote what needs to be done from a climate standpoint. And you could join other companies in doing that, right? Collective action is really key. And I think the last area, which is, is always a challenge, is I think corporations need to figure out if it's products or services, how do you do a better job coming up with alternatives to high carbon intensive products or services and producing you know, much lower carbon intensive products and services and marketing those, right? You, you, you need to, and electric vehicles is a good example. We used to whine all the time, ah, oh, nobody wants to buy these things, they're expensive. You know, there's not enough environmentalists out there that want these. Hey, the bottom line is Tesla figured it out, make the product exciting, show the fact that you don't have to go to gas stations all the time, you could charge at home, figure out ways to make uh, low carbon products and services exciting for customers, not services and products that take away from customers. So, so those areas I think are key for corporate America. 
Fabulous. Alyssa, maybe I'm going to turn to you a little bit because I feel like at, at your company, you're kind of doing that. You're not Tesla, but at Patagonia, I think you've taken on some of the challenges that John is talking about. Yes, absolutely. I mean, a huge focus for us over the past um, many decades, actually, is to identify materials that come from more responsible fibers and resources and um, reduce the carbon impact and also water demand. And so we've been moving our product line over to using mostly recycled materials and renewable materials from preferred sources like organic cotton over conventional cotton. Um, and, and by doing that, we've seen reductions in carbon emissions, but um, there are of course still carbon emissions coming from business. And so I think, the five points that were made are very key for all businesses to think about. And also just having a team on your staff that helps you understand where those emissions are coming from and where the hotspots are in your operations or your supply chain, because there's only so much we can really address at any given time, knowing limited staffing and bandwidth. So if you can identify those hotspots, then you can start addressing those really big emitting materials that you're using or big um, carbon emitting processes that are in your supply chain. And you can start to, I feel like the term low hanging fruit is brought up. You know, you can start to address those low hanging fruits that are gonna get you the big wins. And that's definitely something that's on our mind at Patagonia is how do we start to have cleaner processes in our supply chain and our supply chain is located all over the world and so it's beyond just U.S. boundaries and I think the U.S. has done a really nice job at incorporating more renewable energy options and we're not seeing that same availability in other countries and so that's a really big piece of what we've been thinking about is where are you know where are better places to produce which suppliers are using more renewable energy and those are going to be really important conversations to have and areas of collaboration for those like in our industry or in adjacent industries to us so you mentioned you use the term low-hanging fruit and and i do want to ask a follow-up for the for the whole panel I, when I was at a business school, we talked a lot about sort of embedding sustainable practices within existing business models. But there's this sort of side conversation that some people see as fringe, some people see as revolutionary in sort of a Che kind of revolutionary way, which is fundamentally altering markets. And I think Naomi Klein's book uh, from a few years ago really kind of put this on center stage. Um, people kind of reacted violently to it, I think, especially within some corporate circles. But by and large, these ideas are starting to gain traction. So maybe for, for, for all of you, what kinds of changes could we imagine that are more fundamentally transformative, transformative market level changes that would really sort of get us beyond the low hanging fruit to maybe having to climb the ladder a little bit to do something that's profoundly different within kind of the business sphere? Another really easy question for you. Can I jump in, Joe? Sure. One one thing I wanted to point out before talking about the kind of complete, you know, systems change that you're alluding to that Amy mentioned that is really kind of really reframing um, business business models completely, which I think is kind of what needs to happen. Um, I, I want to emphasize that what I'm seeing uh, as to what needs to happen in these next 10 years, I mean, I just couldn't agree more with John on all of those points. Um, and a recent analysis we did with uh, Deloitte called Pathways to Net Zero really was looking at how kind of how you'd get there, basically, how would different sectors and industries get there. And the thing that kind of uh, kept coming up to me is just this realization that companies need to be doing all of what Joe was saying and, you know, in the next 10 years, really make sure they're prioritizing the right things. And a couple things um, are uh, really in top level importance. One is completely outside the value chain, and that is stopping tropical deforestation. So, you know, as if things aren't hard enough, we need to really urgently stop tropical deforestation because there's no path to a stable climate without doing that. And we need to kind of collectively take responsibility for that. 
Um, in addition, we are really seeing that companies need to focus on short-lived climate pollutants like um, methane, for example, maybe not as much of an issue for some of these companies, but it's really critical um, in the energy industry, in food and ag, um, that we address those short-lived climate pollutants. Otherwise, the path to net zero becomes a lot harder and it also affects when we achieve net zero. So um, before we even talk about you know, business model transformation, I wanted to make those a uh, couple of important points. That's terrific. Other thoughts on this, maybe you know, from a, a Microsoft, Patagonia, John and your former role perspective, this idea of transformative change? I can jump in. Um, I, I mean, I think that there's building on what Elizabeth said. I think that there are there are pieces where we need to think about new business models in the context of public private partnerships. Um, and uh, I sometimes talk about that internally with our our programs, which you know we have sort of a public sector side, and then we work with big companies, and we're trying to solve the same problems. And I've sort of spent my life doing various different versions of public private partnerships. And it's really interesting to think about that internally to Microsoft, because um, I think we need to build new business models. For example, even tracking, Elizabeth mentioned protecting um, forests and uh, protecting our ecosystems more broadly and understanding what our decisions, what the decisions we're making, what implications those have for ecosystems in our you know, uh, interconnected world is we still can't do that very well in a, in a really operational way. And that takes, that takes not just satellites, it takes science, it takes people, it takes decisions, it takes working together. And so I think there's a real opportunity to think about public-private partnerships and business models to get that, in, to get that information and um, support um, business solutions to those. Um, you know, we in Satie, our CEO says, um, we want to build uh, profitable solutions to for people and planet. And I think there really is an emerging opportunity for uh, the for sustainability uh, being a, lead, a driver in uh, for businesses. And certainly at Microsoft, it's it's a big focus in terms of how can we support that the digital the transformation to sustainability. But doesn't that speak to the need to measure different things? When I think about what companies are typically putting in their sustainability reports, I see the carbon emissions, you know, I see the land use impacts, I see the tropical deforestation or deforestation in general. But there are a lot of social impacts that I think, Amy, you're alluding to that I don't see working their way into, on the one hand, these, these sustainability reports that come out of the world's leading companies. But maybe more fundamentally, I don't see them embedded in sort of the strategic decision making of companies. So, with some exceptions. So, you know, there's this short termism, this this kind of profitable solutions um, philosophy that it's it's hard to argue with in business. But if it's not kind of buttressed against social impact as a kind of a driver of business strategy, can we reasonably expect that kind of fundamental transformation to actually happen? Yeah, Joe, I, I'll jump in on that because I think it's tied to the other question as well. I, I Transformation, I think, really needs to happen to address environmental issues, but also to address social issues. And I think oftentimes corporations are in their mindset that we produce a certain product or service. Transformation on addressing environmental or social is kind of out of our purview, so therefore we can't work on it. And that's never the case because I think environmental and social could always be in your purview. So an example I'll give is when we think about providing transportation in sub-Saharan Africa, right? We're not going to follow the Henry Ford model, right? Where there's going to be Model Ts and refineries and that's not going to happen. But, you know, transportation can be clearly very positive in terms of providing people um, access to goods and services and other things. So if transportation needs to be expanded, access in sub-Saharan Africa, and we need to be mindful of the environment and the social aspect, what are we doing from a business standpoint as an automotive industry to not only provide zero emission vehicles, but maybe working with microgrids, because that's going to be more realistic, right? Working with 
the governments to allow access to the transportation itself for other companies to use those vehicles to bring medicines and others. How are we thinking about actually expanding our business in those areas, but not going down our traditional path of providing transportation, but absolutely thinking about the environmental and social requirement on how that transportation needs to be provided. That's a type that I, of transformation I think companies need to have. I wanted to mention too just ideas around the circular economy. And I think that that is something that could deeply improve how we all operate as businesses, thinking about the inputs and the end of life situation of all of the materials that we're using to make our products. And I feel like like the car industry is a really great example of one that has had a great circular um, system in place for a lot of years, selling used cars, using used parts. Um, and we have been trying to support something like that in the textile and outdoor apparel industry. But I think taking more responsibility for you know, what we're using to make our products and then what happens to them at the end of life so that they don't become waste and they can once again become some sort of resource that makes something new again. I think we would start to address this take, make, waste issue that we have where we're just using resources and we end up throwing them away. And that is not going to lead us to um, this more environmentally friendly future that we all hope for. Is it, um, you know, I, I think about Patagonia in particular, but you brought it up, um, Alyssa, with respect to other industries, you know, upcycling, recycling, using materials. You know, at Patagonia, there's the famous don't buy this jacket sort of philosophy. There is sort of a kind of reuse kind of philosophy. Um, without getting into your financial bottom line, because that's not the purpose of this talk, but is that a model that's working for a company like yours? And can you see that being onboarded across not only the textile industry, I see you, you as your company are doing it in agriculture. I mean, is it something that's transportable from sector to sector? Or is it something that just is very niche and you're good at it because you're good at it? I think, I mean, I think it's a huge, um, hugely important issue for Patagonia and a good, big focus for us and has been for years. So it's a big value of ours, but I have seen it growing that interest in those types of programs in the textile and apparel and outdoor space over the last several years. And there's companies that have come about like the renewal workshop that are providing that service for companies that don't want to manage it all in-house. And so there are these different models of how to go about it now with certain companies providing services and then other um, companies deciding to, you know, keep it in-house. And so I think that it's becoming far more common now to see different brands have an end of life um, reuse program or some type of garment recycling program in place. And I also would like to just say, I feel like I see a lot of articles coming out right now about how our recycling system is broken and, you know, it's not working, but I, like, I sort of hate seeing those things because although it's not perfect, it is important. So just because it's not working, doesn't mean we should stop doing it and stop trying to improve it. I think there's a, a lot of potential for innovation in that space that will prepare us for the future. And I think, yeah, absolutely not perfect, but absolutely not something for us to just overlook and say, oh, well, that didn't work. You know, let's let's think of something else. Like, I think we absolutely need to be finding value in the resources that we've already used so that we don't have to keep taking new resources. Fascinating. Um, sticking with this topic of these sort of transformational changes, I want to talk a little bit about technology. Um, I think there's a large fraction of, of the population out there, some of them in elected office, who think that um, consumer behavior isn't really where we need to go, but that technology will save us. I mean, for the record, I think to all your points, we need a full court press on these things. It's not going to be any one uh, particular segment that's going to get us to where we want to go. But on the technology side, do we see really exciting opportunities when it comes to technology? And I think I'll start with you on this one, Amy, because of some of the announcements that Microsoft has made, not just to become a net zero company, but to kind of take back all of your carbon emissions going back to the company's founding, which to me sounds like a non-trivial challenge and one that's going to rely on technology. So what do you, what do you think of the technology uh, as something that's going to save us uh, question? Well, let me first just 
um, have a simple answer that no, I don't think technology will save us. Um, people have to save us. We we have to make those decisions across and and uh, transformative changes. Um, having said that, of course, uh, technology can help. And at Microsoft, we we certainly believe that. Um, maybe I'll, I'll touch on that from from two angles. Um, one on, on the carbon removal, since you mentioned it, but um, I also want to highlight, you know, looking back to the conversation we just had in uh, a little while ago around transformation. I mean, one one area that I think is really in, critical for getting us to the transformations towards sustainability that we need is digitalization. The digital transformation, I think, has a huge role to play um, in transforming business models, transforming how we do things, um, how we govern um, that could have a, could, could really um, do a lot to bring us to where we need, need to be. And we work, we work with, uh, with companies and governments in, in, in those areas. Um, in the context, but that's only gonna work if the digital sector itself is, can be, can be uh, zero carbon. And obviously this, our industry is a, a big energy user, um, but we are leaning in and recognizing as a big company and as a company that has been around for a while and has, has been a part of the problem, um, we need to do more than just get to net zero on our own books. We need to remove all of the emissions that we have put into the, um, into the atmosphere since the start of our company. And um, so that we can really be a contributor to uh, the global effort to get to, to net zero and ultimately net negative. So how are we gonna do that? Well, uh, we go to experts like Elizabeth's team and others to help guide some of the different uh, efforts that we're doing. But we have we've two different processes. From a technology standpoint, we have a billion dollar fund that is investing in building technologies to remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the geosphere, store it for thousands, millennia, um, out, so it really stays out of the atmosphere. The, the challenge is, is while there's been a lot of advancements in that technology, uh, it's still super expensive. And even if we wanted to purchase all, to compensate for all the emissions today by buying that technology, we can't because there's not enough supply. So we're investing in that so that we can achieve our goal and so others can, the price point can get down so that others can do the same. But then there becomes another really important part for, for doing that. And that is nature. Nature's figured out how to get carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and we unfortunately tend to, to cut those trees down. Um, and so working through the process of how we can hold carbon in nature, and I say hold it in nature because I think it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not as, as durable as it doesn't, it's not as permanent as um, the, the type of technological solutions that store it in the geosphere. And so we, are, we have a comprehensive sustainability goals in the context of ecosystems, of water, um, also social justice issues and, and waste and, and thinking about how we invest in landscapes in our ecosystems holistically, um, I think is really important. Um, and getting the, the, figuring out how to do that so that we can help our pathway to uh, get to net zero um, and get to net negative uh, is also a really critical piece. But ultimately, um, the the technology in the long run will be important, I believe, carbon, the, re, the removal of carbon to be able to store it in, in the geosphere over the long term. So is this, this sounds like then a very, this is, it sounds like a long-term strategy. It's, you're not playing the short game when it comes to, to this approach. I mean, whether it's geologic sequestration or sequestration in nature, we're talking decades or more to get to a place where you might be able to see the impacts you're talking about? Well, I'm not sure I would, um, I would say it's a short and long term, you know, right? We have a, we have a, we have annual goals and we have decadal goals. Um, and, uh, but I think we need to think of, we need to invest now if we're going to be able to have the technologies we need in a couple of decades. 
And we're going to need to invest now if we want to have the uh, sort of markets that available to be able to manage um, and invest appropriately in nature to be able to meet our goals, to meet our goals for carbon, to meet our goals simultaneously for water and biodiversity and uh, social justice. We, I think with the climate challenge, we've been sort of blinded by urgency, if you will, in the sense of really solving the problems of today or thinking about 2100. Um, but I think we need to think of this as a continuum because it, it's a marathon and a sprint at the same time. And we really need to think of that, 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 that whole spectrum. Other thoughts from, from panelists on innovative, exciting technological solutions you're seeing out there. We talked obviously about carbon um, capture and sequestration. We talked about um, you know, upcycling and circular economy. Other things that you've sort of encountered in your roles that um, get you excited or give you hope or preferably both? Yeah, I'll jump in from a transportation standpoint. Um, but first of all, I just want to comment on, um, you know, is technology going to solve a problem? And I couldn't agree more with Amy. I love this continuum that she talked about because I think people are sitting on the sidelines thinking, hey, some real smart people somewhere are going to just figure all this out and we can keep living the life we're living and it'll all go away. And I think some real smart people are probably going to figure out eventually the issue is when those big things are going to be figured out and we've lost a lot of time and emitted a lot of carbon so i think that needs to happen but back to the continuum i think that we all you know all companies should be thinking about what choices and technology can they be providing to customers today that reduces their customers footprint right not waiting for just the grand solution but help customers with their behaviors use products that are more responsible from a carbon standpoint. So I think that could be happening today. But Joe, back to your question for transportation. What I'm really excited about, and again, see, when you're retired, you could read all these things and get excited mm -hmm. about, you know, a lot of stuff. You know, everybody focuses on lithium ion batteries and battery storage, and we're making great advancements, and there's a lot of money going into that area. But I really have heard and, and am hopeful that some breakthrough energy storage device or chemistry is going to be made available that's going to allow a high density amount of storage at a low cost because once that happens the switch could flip tomorrow on all vehicles being electric because that's what's holding vehicles right it's the cost of the battery and if you talk about stationary storage for energy if, if they could figure out that holy grail of a chemistry breakthrough like a supercapacitor I, it's it's a game changer, I think, in terms of uh, you know a big technology that can move us forward. Super. Listen, we're I want to make sure that we have time for questions. We're getting a lot of questions um, appearing in the chat, um, but I do want to tackle kind of one of the the big elephants in the room right now, and we've touched on it a little bit. Um, you know, it's it's sort of the social aspect of sustainability and climate change. We've alluded uh, to some of the inequalities that are inherent in the climate and sustainability um, conversations. This question is really about the role of, of companies in sort of advancing political discourse when it comes to sustainability and maybe in particular um, climate change. So maybe starting with Alyssa and, and even Elizabeth on, on this one, um, is there a role for companies to play in not just sort of throwing their support behind whoever's in office at a particular point in time, but really kind of walking their talk in a consistent fashion when it comes to politics and policy. I kind of feel like the whiplash we see, you know, with every election cycle is exacerbated in a way by some companies sort of supporting this candidate, you know, when they're in office and then suddenly pivoting and supporting this other candidate because that's the politically expedient thing to do. And, you know, honestly, I shake my head and I'm not going to give any, uh, I'm not going to name any names, but we saw this just with the last couple of elections where companies that were behind one guy suddenly pivoted and were, they were behind the other guy and now they're behind the other guy again and I don't know what's going on anymore. So maybe Alyssa and Elizabeth walking the talk on politics and companies when it comes to climate change. Possible, not possible. What are your, what are your thoughts? Um, I can start us off. So um, I work for Patagonia and we're privately held and we're owned by the Chouinard family that 
has been deeply connected and um, cared about the environment for their entire lives and definitely the entire existence of this company. And so I will say, like, I think this is something that Patagonia has done really well in that two things. We really want people to vote. We believe in activism and voting is like the baseline. That's where everyone gets to start. So get out there and vote. But we have always had these campaigns where it is vote the environment. It's not necessarily about who the politician is or what party it is at all. It is, you know, learn about your candidates, understand what their value system is, and do they have the environment in mind? And are they supportive of environmental protections, public lands, you know, clean water, healthy rivers? And if that's the case, like that's your candidate for your community or your state or your um, country. And so I think that that's something that we've done you know, year after year, and we have absolutely gotten more vocal in the last um, handful of years because of, one, I think we grew up a bit as a company, we've gotten bigger, our voice is a bit louder, and we were seeing the direction on environmental policy going in a way that we didn't want it to go. And so I think it's been really interesting for to see Patagonia engage on some really key issues, and one of them has been public lands. And that's an interesting issue because it it definitely can straddle the two parties, right? Like we don't want to create polarization where there doesn't need to be. Public lands is an issue that is valuable to outdoor enthusiasts. And those outdoor enthusiasts might be very liberal um, Democrats, or they might be, you know, folks that live in the middle of the US that are hunters and fishermen, and they want to keep their communities clean, and they want to have access to the land that they um typically have had access to. And so I think that a lot of these environmental issues, it doesn't have to be political. It can straddle party lines and you can get coalitions of people that believe um, in the same dreams for their community, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. And I guess I'd say that, um, you know, how can any company leader look at the data and not see the climate as a crisis, right? And if it is an existential crisis, you know, what do you do as a company, right? How do you react? How do you prioritize public policy in that? You know, do you, how do you think about it in, with regard to other, in, in balancing with other tax or trade policies? It just needs to be elevated to, um, to a whole different level. It needs to be a top advocacy priority. Um, and I would say that uh, companies most underused um, weapon in fighting climate change is, is political advocacy. It seems to me that that like stopping deforestation is one of these things that kind of kind of feels very outside of the company's walls and the company's uh, value chain. And yet it is one of those things that is just a, a top priority. Um, so am I hopeful? Yeah, I'm hopeful, I think, because of um, the youth of today clamoring for action, for employees who are, who are saying, look, we're not gonna work for you as a company unless you are a leader in this space. Um, shareholders pushing on these things and of course good old <laughs> environmental groups who've been saying it for a long time but you know the reality is there is no path forward without doing this so it's time for companies to step up in this space too. My, my colleague Tom Lyon um, talks about um, not just corporate social responsibility but corporate political responsibility. He's got this famous sort of quote or at least I think it's a famous quote uh, that CSR needs some CPR, corporate political responsibility. If we were really pushing corporate political responsibility as a frontline issue, not just corporate social responsibility, might we be able to sort of change the conversation to get um, corporate America away from this sort of uh, political pendulum? Kind of going off script here, but I'm very curious about your thoughts on this one. If it were as sort of mainstream as CSR, would we, would we see some differences? Yeah, I am sure we absolutely would. And I think that, I think that's part of our evolution. And by our, I mean, corporate America. Um, I think 
CSR reports weren't a thing um, 20 years ago, and now they've become more and more standard. And businesses that didn't do them in the beginning are doing them now. Um, and I think that it's hard for corporations sometimes to have a voice on these things. And sometimes it comes out very inauthentic. And so it's something that the business has to be behind in an authentic way in order for it to be meaningful. And you can't rush that, you know, but I think that seeing more and more companies have a voice about something that they really care about. I do believe that that will gain traction of, you know, over the next few decades as we watch it. Um, but Again, it needs to be authentic, and sometimes it's hard for businesses to find that authentic voice. Okay, let me start with some of the questions, maybe staying with this theme of, of policy and, and politics. There's a, a comment from, from my colleague Jill Sohm about the role of policy in pushing companies to do the right thing. To I think the subtext here is not just making it sort of a voluntary thing that companies do or some companies do, but really sort of using policy levers to get companies moving in the right direction. And then a related question from Elizabeth Fenner about um, carbon taxes as, as a policy instrument. And I'm, I'm reminded of, Amy, what you were talking about with respect to carbon removal and some of the technologies that um, might need to be utilized there, but there's not enough supply, it's costly. Your thoughts as a panel on this question of the role of policy and sort of giving guardrails to business and maybe a more, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, in a more sort of sustained fashion, if you'll pardon the pun, and then specifically on this question of, of carbon taxes. Any takers on these? I'll just say that we won't get where we need to go with voluntary corporate action alone. So, I mean, policy is is got to got to raise the floor. You, you know, you have some unique companies here, right? Patagonia, Microsoft, um, Ford, and they're the leaders. And it would be great, I think, if everyone would just follow. Um, I've spent my whole career doing corporate partnerships. And the reality is that, you know, that alone is just not going to get us where we need to go. We need to have public policy and um, any and all ways to, to price carbon, I think are, are on the table. You know, ideally we would have a, a cap on carbon emissions, but um, politically, I don't know that that's feasible. It's instead, um, you know, carbon tax may be, may be the way to go there. I would say, you know, following up on that, I think that I agree. Um, uh, and and even in the sort of carbon removal side, in the transition to us all reducing um, as much as we can, um, and and you know, we we've committed to uh, uh, being net negative in, by twenty thirty, um, and. Uh, but we're we we are as I had said before part of that in the transition. Uh, even though we're going to be 100% renewables by 2025, we to to get where we need to do where we need to be. We also need to invest in nature and in in removals and doing that well is tough. And without government oversight, it makes it even more tough. We put so much time into doing the process of trying to get really high quality carbon offsets. And the reality is it, it's difficult because it's, it takes a lot of time just to figure out if, they're, if they are good quality and if they will last and if they are additional. And so um, government oversight in that side is also really important as a parallel track to to getting to net zero in just a couple of decades. Yeah, the one thing I, I'm just gonna quickly add, and um, it's it's really, I, I, I think policies do need to be put in place because I agree with Elizabeth that, you know, if it's just voluntary, we're not gonna get to where we need to go. But I do think it's important that policymakers, rather than just using a stick, to try to work with companies on a solution. I'm gonna give again, kudos to EDF. I know when I was involved in negotiations with, you know, if it was the ARB or EPA, um, 
getting into a room and saying, right, this is where we need to go from a climate standpoint, business, what do you need to get there versus we're just going to put this out there and you better just meet it, right? Because then we're going to spend all of our energy fighting that versus trying to figure out how we can get there and then what do you need corporations from a policy standpoint that will enable you to deliver the goals that we need to have for climate. So working together, I think is really important, but we need to have policy. So John, though, what about the argument that I hear a lot when, when, when that kind of um, comment is put out there that, well, we just don't have time for that. Like we don't have time for business to sort of kind of move slowly. I mean, you've had experience at Ford and a lot of other panelists have had experience with this too, where, you know, I'm not saying that we, we, I'm saying that it's a crisis. I mean, we don't have a ton of time, let's, let's face it. But the argument that your perspective, John, that idea of working together is it's going to take too long. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, Joe, that, um, you know, you you can't take too long to agree upon what that policy needs to be. So I think you're going in position should be try to work together to see if you could work it out. But I think that at some point you say the companies are not willing to move forward fast enough, you have to cut and run. And that's just not the government. That's where I think NGOs could actually be helpful as the middle to come in and say, look, if this isn't happening, we need to move on and just set policy because the other side is not coming to the table. But at least try to start with that and see if you come up with some solutions. Thank you. So I've got another question here. This one's from from David uh, Price. I'm going to see if I can paraphrase this one. Basically, what he's saying is, you all, um, at least the corporate representatives on the panel, with no disrespect to Elizabeth at EDF, you know, are from large, successful companies that can afford to leave a little bit of money on the table in order to behave sustainably. What do we say to the smaller companies, and in particular to companies in the developing world who are providing products and services for the masses so that they can jump on board kind of the sustainability and climate change train too, because their margins are going to be a whole lot narrower uh, than than those of some of the larger uh, companies out there. Um, I mean, for a smaller business, I I often look at them with envy a bit because I feel like you're just getting started. You probably know exactly every material that's in your product. You probably know your supply chain um, exactly. And that is where you have a lot of control and you can choose the materials you use. You can choose the supply chain that you work with um, and make those strategic decisions very early on. So you're setting yourself up really well. Um, and I feel like I've seen some good examples in, in our industry from companies like Allbirds, and they just did a really big ad around climate in the New York Times for Earth Week. And I think that's a great example of a company that's carefully selected materials and created a supply chain that they know really well. And I think that's a great example for smaller companies. Um, I think it's thinking about the environment and social implications of your business from day one. And it's a lot easier to control when you are small. Uh, I'll jump in there here too. I mean, I, I, but I also think, I mean, I agree, I get, agree with um, what was just said, but I, I, I would also say that um, there is a responsibility on the uh, larger companies, I think, to do more um, and to invest in supporting the institutional and policy environment so that um, other companies can move on a path that's lower carbon. Uh, and, you know, that that has to all happen quickly. So it's, it's not easier said than done, of course. But I do think that we can't expect uh, the same rate of change of the from the smaller and less um, and from some of the you know, less developed re- regions of the world to go on the same path. But we have to make sure that they don't go on the path that we mistake, we did previously, right? We have to, we have to set that groundwork to enable that, to facilitate that. Um, and that, that as corporation, but also as society, I think that that's a global, global issue. This is maybe a, an opportunity to emphasize something that John mentioned earlier, which is the incentive side of things, right? To try and help companies, small, especially smaller companies get there. Um, we need to do a tremendous amount of work 
and transformation in a very short amount of time. And so, you know, per what Amy was saying about companies who can uh, lead and who can invest, do so, have government policy to help with incentives. Um, it, it's just, it is really a, a climate justice is issue that we um, that we bring everyone along on this journey to a, a cleaner, greener future, and that's um, including the the developing world. And so, I think there's um, it, you know, <laughs> just reading Bill Gates's book, <laughs> Amy, you'll be proud. <laughs> um, but it's it's very thoughtful and just makes the point that look. Um, we have more flexibility here in this country and these companies to make this transition, but we've got to make sure that everyone comes along on this journey because everyone deserves to have energy and everyone deserves to have a full life and they deserve to be on the, the path that we have um, trod, but without so much impact. And I think there's a way to do that. Clearly, we're all optimists. We're, we're, we're in this business of, of trying to help save the planet. So we're optimistic it can be done. So on that note, a question from Henry Zhao, um, is it desirable or in my words, ethical for businesses to wade into topics like climate change without also getting into the harder topic of social and environmental justice? So I'll jump in on that because it was actually was a point I was gonna make based on Elizabeth's point is that you know, from my point, from my perspective that, you know, the idea of the need for a just transition to a decarbonized world is much more than a moral issue. It's much more than an ethical issue. It's just, we're not going to be able to get to net zero in, a, in the next two decades unless we have everybody on board moving towards that direction. It's just not going to happen. So to me, social justice and equity issues is central to the whole movement. It has to be. And, um, and that reorients, when that becomes central, it reorients your thinking about how do we approach this game? And, you know, it's been a tough year, but if we can come out of this recognizing that that's central, then at least some, some good things will, will have come, even though it's hard to say, to say that uh, at all, because I know there's been a lot of pain and we're experiencing and we're remembering it at, on these days as well. So, but I do think that, that that is a very important thing for us all to remember. Okay, we've only got a, a, a couple of minutes left and I'm, I'm not gonna let you go without, without holding the, the feet of business schools to the fire. I, I promised I would do it. So with, with the two minutes we have left, what is the advice that you would give to not only business school students, but business schools themselves when it comes to preparing the next generation of environmental and sustainability leaders on issues like climate? I'm shocked and appalled that there are still business schools out there that don't frontline. In fact, the majority of business schools out there don't frontline sustainability in their core curricula. It's relegated to these institutes, to these side issues, it's not sort of mainstream. What, what's your kind of plea or advice or mandate for business schools uh, and business school students going forward? Maybe John, let's start with you since you are actually a, a fellow at a business school now. Yeah, I would say that um, just like with a business, you have to drive sustainability into all the functions in terms of environmental and social thinking. You have to have that lens. We need in business schools for all the courses, it doesn't have to, it, may, it shouldn't just be a separate course, but in each of the courses, what's the environmental and social lens that are being taught along with the other, what you would say are core disciplines for marketing or finance. It has to be ingrained in all, the, all of the various disciplines in order for it to take with the students and bring it forward. Other thoughts on this one? I will just chime in and say that I completely agree with what John just said. I think it needs to be in every course and not sidelined as this extra thing that some students choose to take and others don't choose to take. I think it should be a fundamental understanding that future business leaders have in their education. That this environmental and social theme needs to be um, considered with all business decisions. Yeah, I, I think if, if business schools want 
to thrive into the future, they need to realize that this is generation climate, right? And they are hungering for training in these skills and understanding and knowledge, and they want to be environmental leaders. Um, more than 10 years ago, EDF started a program for grad students to go into companies for a summer called Climate Core, and that thing's grown to be, um, you know, we have more than a thousand applicants. It's it's crazy, and that's just an indicator that these students uh, don't want sustainability to, see, to be something that's a bolt-on. They want it to be core to their education, just what just like what John was saying. And the business school, if they are going to um, grow and thrive and address the needs of students on into the future, has got to do that and have that be core to their um, to their mission in the world. So I guess I'll just add a couple of words. I agree with all that has been said. You know, what I would say though is that in addition to that, you need, I think that the business leaders of tomorrow need to be bilingual in both the natural and the digital world, because I think it's at that intersection that new business models are going to really be created to drive us forward. And if you're not really fluent in those, in understanding the natural world, and understanding the digital world, you can't be creative in thinking about those new business models to drive the transformative change that we need. Fantastic. Well, Elizabeth, Amy, Alyssa, John, what a privilege it has been for me to, to spend my lunch hour with you. I can't thank you enough for, for taking time out. Uh, again, my thanks to Grow at Annenberg, the Center for the Political Future, and all the folks who are working behind the scenes, Jesse, Erica, Jessica, uh, Katie, all the folks that I get to work with that never appear on camera. You guys are absolutely amazing and it's a privilege to work with you. And then lastly, thanks to all of you who joined us today over your lunch break. I hope this was informative. I encourage you to tune in tomorrow for our next Climate Forward lunchtime discussion. And with that, uh, we, we leave you with, with sustainability in our, our hearts and, and you know real hope for the future. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful day. Thanks so much.